Hello and welcome back to the channel. Here's the tech news for this week. Here's what's been going on. Plastic processors for a less than a penny a piece. Researchers designed cheap plastic processors that could usher in the age of truly ubiquitous electronics. Researchers have designed a new plastic processor which they estimate will be able to be mass produced for less than a penny. The chip designs we currently use, even for the most basic microcontrollers, are too complex to be mass produced in plastic. Last year, ARM and Pragmatic IC <laughs> announced that the development of the plastic ARM prototype, which implemented the ARM M0 processor design, incorporating over 56,000 semiconductor devices for a flexible and cheap microchip. This latest research suggests that a completely new architectural approach was needed to achieve usable yields and a subpenny chip. To address the peculiarities of plastic chip design, the Universities of Illinois team built the new FlexiCore processor design from scratch. Because yields dive when processor gate counts rise, they decided to make a minimal design that will reduce the gate count and use 4-bit and 8-bit logic instead of 16-bit or 32-bit alternatives. There is still work to be done and the researchers have already tried optimizing FlexiCore design for different processes and target workloads with some success. It will be interesting to read about how flexing chips affects performance and how durable these things really are. With this subpenny plastic processor and the move of flexible electronics from niche to mainstream, we may see the dawn of truly ubiquitous electronics. The above research is going to be presented at the International Symposium on Computer Architecture later this month, so we should learn more about it and further development plans soon from Tom's Hardware. Ethereum miners spend, or they did spend, $15 billion US dollars on GPUs alone during the latest crypto craze. When Ethereum prices rose steeply in October to November 2020, millions of people started mining Ethereum coins to make some easy money. They used graphics cards bought at retail, and their purchases coincided with skyrocketing demand from gamers, as both AMD and NVIDIA released very competitive Radeon RX 6000 and GeForce RTX 30 series cards late 2020. Those GPUs are still the best graphics card around at this point. Demand from gamers and miners exceeding supply, though prices shot through the roof. This is why the average sale in price of GPUs, which were already sky high in late 2020 due to the rise of PC gaming during the COVID pandemic, increased to unprecedented levels. And here's a chart of the sales for Team Green and Team Red, and then combined. And uh, one thing I took away from this is overall, since 2010, um, it's actually been coming down quite a bit, hasn't it, really? 2015 was a low point. It rose up to 2017, then came back down to 2019. And then as the mining really sort of kicked off again, we saw the increase once more. But we're still nowhere near the numbers that we were back in uh, 2020. So... In terms of um, manufacturing capacity, you would have thought, you know, if we were able to manufacture this many back then, why are we struggling so much now? That could be just a naive look at things, but uh, that, that's what struck me as strange. There's a narrative last year was we can't manufacture them fast enough, we haven't got the capacity and things like that, but uh, it seems like in previous years we've had more capacity. Seems weird. Seems weird. Anyway. Based on data from JPR, desktop GPU sales totaled $51.8 billion for all of 2021. That was spread across the 49.021 million GPUs sold, a four-year high. As far as average pricing is concerned, we're talking about $1,056 per unit in 2021, which is about two times higher than the average price of a high-end graphics card in Q3 2019. So the inflation is obvious. Now that we know the approximate average pricing for a graphics card in 2021 and the amount of money miners spent on GPUs, we can estimate that Ethereum miners consumed roughly 14.2 GPUs from the fourth quarter of 2020 to the end of the first quarter of 2022. So there's the um, slightly more zoomed in uh, chart of those discrete graphics sales. Um, so it has gone up quite a bit in the, uh, in the recent years. And the Ethereum price comes down. 
Ethereum value has dropped 70% this year, so it's unlikely that anyone will be able will buy a stable of new graphics cards for mining Ethereum. People who bought their cards and rigs early enough may have probably earned enough hefty point profits on them when the Ethereum was at its peak, but those who began mining last year are months, if not years, away from recouping their investments. Bloomberg's story also includes a report about the man who invested $30,000 in crypto mining hardware in mid-2021 and has only earned about $5,000 worth of crypto so far. We're pretty sure other miners have found themselves in the same situation. And that's kind of what we were warning people about last year when people were sort of trying to get in when Ethereum was near 4K. We were, we were kind of nervous about um, that situation. Coupled that with the uh, scarcity of cards coming through, we were quite often advising people that you can only have one card because of the supply. And I wouldn't recommend getting into Ethereum now at this point anyway because of the parabolic rise that we've been seeing. Um, plus the imminent, well, seemingly then imminent uh, merge and move to proof of stake. It didn't seem like a viable option longer term. GPU price drops are coming bigger and faster, but be careful. Graphics card prices are dropping swiftly, but beware of GPUs bargains. Yes. In NVIDIA's case, just the highest-end GPUs, the RTX 3090 Ti, RTX 3090, and RTX 3080 Ti, have dropped below their recommended price. Well, the 3090 is level with its MS MSRP, in fact. All other Ampere GPUs from the RTX 50, 3050 up to and including the vanilla 3080 are still priced over MSRP at retailers, whereas AMD, only the 6800 XT and 6800, 6800 remain above their MSRP. As for the used market, average eBay sold prices have witnessed some huge drops, such as NVIDIA's RTX 3060 Ti plunging by 19% and the RTX 3080 by 17%, with the RTX 3070 not far off that on a 15% decrease. eBay sellers and scalpers were selling these things for so much money that uh, it uh, there's a lot to fall, you know? Uh, they take the risk. Crypto storm rages with multi, with major caveats on GPUs, the used ones. We've just seen a big crypto crash, and of course, rapidly rising electricity prices mean that crypto mining has hit simultaneously by major cost increases and big chunks being torn out of the profitability. The predictable result is that folks are looking to give up their mining rigs and endeavors and rushing to get GPUs into auction sites and sell them off mainly because they realize others will have the same idea and they want to beat the rush and get a better price before a flood of second-hand graphics cards come into the market depress asking prices even further, which we can see is already happening. On top of this, there are next-gen GPUs from both AMD and Nvidia on the horizon, and these could go on sale as early as September. You should exercise caution about buying a used GPU that has been in a mining rig. These cards are often run around the clock and pushed hard. And a bit like a car which has been driven hard and thrashed by its owner, they have many more proverbial miles on the clock than their age would indicate, and potentially much more chance of going wrong in the future as a result. On the flip side of that, they've been tried and tested, and uh, they've been pushed to the limits and still carrying on, so maybe it's a sign that it's been a good card. You never know. Two ways of seeing that one, really. Five gaming items you didn't know you could claim on tax. Bit of a cheeky, cheeky post, this one. I like it. What can you claim? Well, you can claim quite a matter of, quite a lot, as a matter of fact. Computers. This covers laptops, tablets, and pre-built desktop PCs. Peripherals. This can include mice, keyboards, headphones, microphones, webcams, and external hard drives. Generally under three hundred dollars. You know, don't push a look. Software. This one's a bit fuzzier. You'll be hard pressed to claim any games back. Sorry, unless games are a significant part of your day-to-day -day role in your job. But you can likely claim any software you've had to buy for work. This could be like Office 365, Adobe CS subscription, for example. And remember, you have to pay for these things out of your pocket, or they don't count. If your work provides you with an Office 365 sub, or reimburses the monthly charge, you can't claim it. Internet expenses. Did you know that if you're working from home, you can claim a percentage of your home internet and phone expenses? 
yep, you can. And uh, you can even do a split. So if you, you know, you can do like a 50-50 or whatever, if you use it for work and at home. There's been a lot of people working from home lately these last couple of years, so check it out. Office furniture, you know, a lot of people when they were forced to work from home didn't have a work from home environment. So they had to buy desks and chairs and things like that to, to get set up. Worth a look. And of course, check with a licensed tax agent to ensure any deductions you are making are above board. The last thing you want is to misfile part of your tax return and end up owing the ATO money down the road. Moving on. Diablo Immortal has made 34.6 million Aussie dollars in the two weeks since launch. Despite widespread criticism of its microtransaction strategy, Diablo Immortal is still making a ton of money. Blizzard's latest mobile game has raked in 24 US million dollars, about 34 million Aussie dollars, in its first two weeks since launch. Diablo Immortal downloads have topped 5 million since June 2. This makes it Blizzard's second highest earner on mobile, outstripped by only by the collectible card game Hearthstone. The US and South Korea top of the list countries pouring money into the game, with the US accounting for a whopping 43% of all transactions. <laughs> Damn. South Korea follows in second place with a 23% contribution. Japan, Germany, and Canada make up the remainder of the top five. I guess Australians have more sense. <laughs> Players like NZ streamer, a New Zealand streamer, Quinn69, have dropped vast sums of money into the game in hopes of an ultra-rare five-star legendary gem. Wow. Diablo Immortal has been under fire for its microtransaction since, launch, since its launch two weeks ago. Players, even those in Kotaku AU's comments, feel that tying the game's real money transactions to character power is pay-to-win scenario. Yeah, they're not wrong. This, they feel, is anti-ethical to the traditional Diablo loop of growing a character power by grinding end-game bosses for that high-end loot and ruin words. Players have been so mightily unhappily with the game that they drove to the game's Metacritic user score to an all-time low. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, still, it's working. 34 million US dollars, uh, Aussie dollars. It's working. Call of Duty Anti-Cheat now completely disarms cheaters in online matches. Since introducing the Ricochet Anti-Cheat system, the Call of Duty Anti-Cheat team has been implementing new ways to mess with bad actors in online matches. Previously, cheaters have been unable to deal damage to enemy players, have their ability to see or hear the enemy removed, and now, cheaters are having their weapons taken away entirely. The new method will spot cheaters and simply take their weapons away. They won't even be able to deal melee damage with their character's fists. This new disarm approach follows on from other methods Activision has tested, including damage shield, which makes legitimate players inv invulnerable to a cheater's bullets, and cloaking, which makes legitimate players invisible to cheaters. This way, Caught cheaters will remain in the games, develop, uh, giving developers time to analyze, analyze their data while hampering their ability to have an impact on the outcome of a game. I don't know, I kind of feel like if a cheater has their guns taken away, they're probably just going to quit the game pretty straight away. I don't think it's going to have the effect that they're wanting or looking for there. I don't think they're going to stay in the game while the developers track what they you know analyze the data if you're a cheater and you get your weapons taken off then you know that they're onto you so you're just going to quit straight away aren't you surely surely anyway cheap makers agreed to pay bungie 13.5 million dollars in destiny 2 lawsuit settlement over the last few years bungie has been tackling destiny 2 cheats with lawsuits so in the developers and companies selling cheat tools to players this week Bungie actually settled with the people behind a few different cheating sites, with the sellers agreeing to pay 13.5 million US dollars in damages. It just shows how much money is in cheating. It's just crazy. After filing a lawsuit against the operators of Veteran Cheats, Veteran Cheats, should that be Veteran Cheats? I don't know. Lavi Cheats and Elite Boss Tech, Bungie and the cheat sellers have reached a settlement agreement. The defendants will pay $2,000 per violation. 
equating to a massive 13.5 million settlement total. Each unique download of a cheat tool counts as a violation, and with 6,765 unique downloads, things added up quickly. <laughs> 6,700 cheaters. Wow. Bungie's arguments is that these sites profit by compromising the gameplay experience of their game. Other publishers like Ubisoft, Riot Games, Blizzard, and Epic Games have also been known to take legal action against the popular cheat sellers. Yeah, cheaters are a pain, so yeah, sting them. DICE has a three-year plan to save Battlefield. Encouraging news, encouraging news. In recent years, the team at DICE has suffered an unfortunate fall from grace. Despite its selling point as a next-gen Battlefield experience, Battlefield 2042 failed to capture the hearts and minds of fans due to a lacking part of content as well as a litany of books and glitches at launch. DICE have not yet managed to save Battlefield 9, uh, I keep saying 1942, Battlefield 2042, but according to the studio, we are only focusing on Battlefield 2042. When asked whether the studio was focusing solely on Battlefield 2042 and whether all other projects were put on the back burner, um, Rebecca Kutaz responded with a definitive totally, adding that we are focusing only on Battlefield 2042. There is no time for anything else, and this is what we want to do. In three years, we want to be the first person shooter powerhouse that DICE deserves to be, and that is what we're going for. It is a little bit sad. I, I do like DICE and what they've done over the years, so I, I do hope they can bring it back. Uh, Rebecca Kutaz also said, I want to, the team to be really proud about Battlefield 2042. That is what we are chasing and have their heart and the passion there. We want to be really, really proud of DICE. We want DICE to be the number one spot for first-person shooter games in Europe and one of the powerhouses in the world. It's a fabulous team. We're going to make magic together. Oh, isn't that nice? Season 1 is finally here, however, and has brought with it many changes, big and small. Hopefully the team at DICE is as dedicated as Kutas says and that the studio manages to eventually right this ship. Yep, fingers crossed. Hope they can do it. I don't, I don't want them to disappear. I want them to keep making games. Just got to do them better. <laughs> okay, on to the next. Intel Arc A380 GPU official benchmarks. Intel is here with their discrete graphics card. Um, Intel's Arc A380 discrete graphics card is finally launched in China. It's only in China right now. It trades blows with the GTX 1650 and RX 6400 for now. Which is disappointing to some, but this is the, you know, the first go, the first release, and uh, there's, there's more to come. There's a, there's a stack of cards, and uh, yeah, we'll see what they give, see what they bring. Got four gig or six gig flavors, the A370M or the A380, respectively. Um, and compute cores, X cores. We've got eight X cores and eight ray trace units. So we've got dedicated ray tracing, which is cool. Um, there are some specs down here. So all of the testing and official benchmark benchmarks was done using an Intel Core i5 12600K with 32 gig of 3200 megahertz DDR4 RAM and the Windows 11 OS and a four terabyte NVMe SSD. So only the graphics card was changed between these benchmarks. And as we can see on the FPS chart for all these different games, um, it occasionally swaps around with the 1650. Um, as in, like, the arc is slightly faster, but mostly is overall slower than the 1650 GTX. Uh, the Arx 6400, on the other hand, from AMD, uh, quite a bit more often switches around so that the Intel arc is a bit faster performance in some of the games. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit hit and miss, and maybe some driver updates in the future might improve on this. But uh, by the looks of things, it's... Uh, fairly lower mid to entry level offering right now. And a couple more 3D Mark Time Spy. The Arc A380 scores quite well in that. Above the 1650 and the 6400. 
So uh, I guess just the synthetic testing shows it off a little bit more than the real world game results. So uh, yeah, a little bit sort of, it might come down to pricing at this point, if they can beat the 1650 and the RX 6400 in pricing then yeah, sure, okay, that might be worthwhile looking at. Otherwise, if it's more expensive than those, it's going to be in trouble, you know? It all depends on pricing from here. Okay, and lastly, Call of Duty will reportedly get a new mode next year inspired by Escape from Tarkov. I don't know if you know what Escape from Tarkov is, but it's a very cool... Um, sort of like a, a more simulation battle arena kind of style game um i've played a couple of times with uh with just in the bots um so i don't have the full experience to my knowledge but uh very interesting very uh very realistic you know i think very difficult in terms of an online match um i can imagine that uh it's one of the most difficult games out there and just what I've heard about it as well. And it's so successful that Call of Duty jumped on the Battle Royale trend a little late with Warzone, but Activision thinks it may have found the next big thing. According to reports this week, Infinity Ward is preparing a new Call of Duty mode inspired by Escape from Tarkov, with plans to release in 2023. According to Ralph Valve via What If Gaming, the Tarkov-inspired mode has been in development at Infinity Ward for a few years already under the codename Project Nexus. More recently, the new mode has become a high priority for the studio, with plans to launch a standalone as a standalone free-to-play spin-off in 2023. At launch, Modern Warfare 2 2022 will have three core modes, campaign and multiplayer, followed by Warzone in December. The Tarkov-inspired mode will arrive in 2023 instead, and will never uh, and will tell new stories following the events of the campaign with returning characters as well as pve and pvp missions and events so that could be quite cool um on the other hand though tarkov is a fine game on its own and i am a little bit nervous about what activision or Inf infinity ward might do with it um definitely go and check out escape from tarkov and uh, have a look at what that offers because it's really good good gameplay don't go in there run, running around gunning <laughs> you'll get put down pretty quick um, it's a very sneaky sort of shooter sneak around and don't get shot okay and that's it for this week hope you enjoyed the stream and uh, please uh, if there's any of these articles that has inspired you or um, want to discuss any of those feel free to comment in the uh, comments but please like and subscribe to the channel and we'll uh, we'll get some more of these out to you each week. Thanks for your support. Have a good one. Bye.